In this video, I'm going to be making a science fiction style console for action figures and uh, to be used in an action figure diorama, or you could just put it up on a shelf. This one's roughly 112 scale, so it could be used with, uh, we have an AWOC figure here, or you know, Marvel Legends, or any of those 112 scale figures. And obviously, you can scale it uh, to your liking. So a lot of the cuts on this are being done with this hot wire foam cutter, which really allows you to make these nice, smooth cuts, all different angles, and really, you know, very difficult to do those types of cuts with uh, just a straight razor by hand. You can do a lot by hand, but um, the stuff that looks more geometric like that is quite hard to do by hand. Just taking some of the pieces here, just playing with the shapes, right? Even just a cut off from the center console later became the top of uh, the monitor there. I wasn't really planning any of this. I just kind of decided to do a console with a centerpiece, almost um, like a starship bridge with people, you know, that could sit on either side of it, kind of like something you would see in Star Trek. And then just, uh, I didn't draw anything up, just started playing with the shapes. And it's kind of like, you know, playing with wooden blocks or Legos and it all just starts to come together. Gluing this together, I'm using hot glue as well as white glue. The hot glue is just really to kind of hold it there while the white glue, in this case, Aileen's Tacky Glue, dries. I'm sure there's a better way to get angles, uh, but I always kind of just wing it. Sometimes I mess up like this, but you know, foam's uh, relatively inexpensive, so especially when you're doing small things like that. So if I mess up, I'll just make another piece. I always keep figures around to test the scale of things as I'm working on it. And this was just another little cutoff piece that I really didn't intend on using, but it just looked like it would be kind of cool, and it's always nice to add different layers uh, when you're making a console or really anything. The more layers and kind of, uh, I don't know how to put it, but the more layers and details you add, the more interesting it's going to look. I just did a diagonal cut in the same method on the hot wire cutter. I'm not showing all the cuts I do on the hot wire cutter on this one because I didn't want to make it super, super long. And I'm trying not to use time lapse in this video. So this is all real speed so you can see the, at least in the short clips that I'm showing, the pace of you know movement while I'm working on stuff. Sometimes I think the time lapse gets a little disorienting. I would use hot glue on some of these, but these thinner pieces, um, they're not, they don't have the same weight to hold on there, so the tacky glue is fine. And also using hot glue on really thin pieces of foam, it's not too hard to melt through or have an unsightly bump underneath there from where the hot glue was. So all the smaller bits, I generally will just use the Aileen's tacky glue. All these monitors are kind of crazy. I put them all at different angles. I wasn't trying to go for a uniform look at all. I just wanted it to be coherent, but a little bit jumbled, like someone hacked something together, maybe. I'm always wiping the excess tacky glue off with another piece of foam or just a scrap piece of wood or something like that. These monitor frames, I like the way they came out, but for future stuff, I might use a laser cutter that I just, I just finally got a laser cutter. I've been wanting one for a long time, but I do like doing everything by hand for the purpose of these videos. So it's a little bit more accessible for everyone that doesn't have a laser cutter. So 
Some of these smaller bits can be a little bit tedious to put together, but once you kind of get in the flow of it, it's really not that bad. Just remember when doing anything like this, there's no need to try and do it all at once or push it out, you know, just kind of take your time, have fun with it. And like I said, this was not drawn up. I do sketches for lots of the stuff I work on, but these consoles, I've just kind of been winging it. And I've, I don't know, I just, uh, it, it's kind of like doodling, you know, you just have fun, start putting pieces on there and see what comes out. On this style of console, I've been putting like these little access panels on the bottom. I, I don't know, I just kind of like the way they look. So for the buttons on this, some of them were foam, the square buttons. Some of the square buttons were foam, these single square buttons. But to make those little round buttons I've been using, I needed to use polymer clay because I couldn't figure a way to cut the foam. Also, it was going to be very... The edges would not be clean on foam at that size. Maybe there's a, a way. I, you could probably do it with a laser cutter, actually, but this was all done by hand. So I went to the polymer clay, and that worked out fantastically. I have a little toaster oven right here that's just a cheapo. Um, I use it pretty much on the lowest setting because the clay is very thin. And also these little metal punches I got off Amazon that were super cheap. It's a bit fiddly because um, the everything is so tiny but once you get a flow going it's not that bad I did have a problem burning the clay the first time I tried this with this toaster because the temperature measurements were extremely inaccurate for what the little guy was actually putting out. So, But after a couple of uh, times of messing that up, I finally dialed it in. With the smaller pieces, I will use a tweezer because it's just easier to dip into some glue and to line them up. Especially when the little round bits are very, very close together, it's just too small for my fingers. I never used to like using tweezers. It used to be, I don't know, you just have to get used to them because it, it feels cumbersome. But once you start using them, man, really, really useful. Cutting some more trim here on the hot wire cutter. Yeah, so I love this thing for flattening out polymer clay. I think it's a pasta machine. This one's made by Sculpey specifically for this, and it's been really, really sweet, even for just kneading the clay and getting it soft enough to work with. If you didn't have this, you can also knead it by hand and then use a cylinder like a dowel rod or they sell those inexpensive plastic rollers at the craft store and you could roll it out in similar fashion. 
If you're trying to get something uniformly flat like this and you didn't have the spaghetti roller, there's a trick where you can just put two popsicle sticks on either side of the, the piece of clay and then roll your roller across those popsicle sticks and it'll make a uniform height. I didn't capture the painting of this red on camera. This is all done with very, very inexpensive crafts paints, the cheaper ones you would find at a hobby store. I think I'm using, uh, well, I got them right here. Let's see, I'm using Craftsmart and Folk Art paint on this particular one. The red is a cardinal red and that gray is a deep gray. Whenever you're painting styrofoam with craft paint, it always takes more than one coat, usually at least two to look good, sometimes three. Switching to a detail brush here for some of these smaller pieces. Now I could have painted all these bits separate, right? If I knew what I was making before I made it, or now that I've made this one, I could probably do it again and just break everything down into small pieces and then paint all the, like, the little boards separately, then glue them on painted. But it kind of messes with my uh, process of doing this, right? Because I just want to, like, doodle in the foam and, and make something and then paint it afterwards. But it is a little bit more... You have to be careful painting, you know, painting the edges like this. If you don't have a steady hand, it could be a bit challenging, but it's really not that hard once you just kind of go in there and do it. And you can always go back through and touch things up. Everything I make like this, I always end up having to touch little bits up. And if there's a little bit here and there that's not perfect, it doesn't really matter. You know, normal things in life have wear and tear. This is on an old rust bucket spaceship, probably. And it would be totally fine for it to have uh, some dings or... You know, I, I kept this one pretty clean, but I could have just washed the whole thing in black or grimy looking paint to make it look worn anyway. This was an avocado green I was using for these display screens. For the display screens, we can obviously do some paper printouts or something like that or you can even paint, paint in like some lines or something to give it a little bit more character. But I really like the flat look of just the green. It just kind of went with the whole aesthetic that kind of came out on accident while making this retro sci-fi uh, style panels that I've been doing lately. And I just kind of like it. So maybe eventually I'll do something a little fancier, but for right now I'm, I'm digging the green. I tried to keep the lines in here, the separating lines, to have the, the dark gray in there to make, make it more obvious that the keys were separated, but I did get some paint down in some areas, and it, it, it kind of went together. I also got some paint off on the keyboards and messed up a little, but like I said, you go back in, touch it up, not a big deal. What's kind of cool about these is you can use basically any colors you wanted to. Just go look on Pinterest or look up, you know, any kind of color scheme or just make your own. But you can find color schemes of all different colors that are complementary and that go together uh, that I didn't do at all for this process, except I know that the yellow and the red were going to look pretty cool together. And the dark grays, you know, the grays mixed with pretty much everything. But that's what's really cool is you can just paint whatever part 
on here in a repeating kind of pattern like most of my dial the larger circles like this on this piece were yellow I think and then I had the you know repeat green circles and I don't know, it's just kind of zen doing the whole thing. This is me painting a little touch-up there. Like I said, I had to do touch-up plenty of times while doing this, so if you get paint out of the lines, it is not a big deal. For some of the details, I used a Posca paint marker. You don't have to use this, and, and for this Specifically, a paintbrush would have been fine, but I've been used to using them on these. Uh, they work really, really great when you're trying to pick out details on a small 3D print. And I just like them. So originally on this, I was only going to put the yellow in a few spots, but it just had such a retro feel and the yellow just popped off there that I decided to go with more and more of it. I also have some bright green on the end there on those little buttons right there, and I really like the way that came out. I didn't paint every single button. As you can see, I left some of them dark gray, and I, I like that too. I just think the whole thing is just an experiment to play with. You can play around with the colors if you do one like this and it's really fun. Not too sure about that uh, blue there. As you can see here, I'm getting quite a collection of these. Uh, originally, I just started with one of them, and I just made another one and another one. Uh, it's starting to turn into a bit of a starship bridge here, which I may eventually build a actual bridge setup. This chair doesn't exactly go, but it kind of goes. Maybe I'll build a little platform for it, and it'll all kind of tie together. If you want to know when new videos come out or when I'm going live for my chill and craft streams, please hit that notification bell and subscribe.